Well, thank you very much, um, Paul, and good evening, everyone. It is my absolute privilege and pleasure to be asked by Libby and Paul to be part of this Truth and Charity series. And it's also really heartening to have dear friends within the audience, and I'm especially thankful for your presence here this evening. What I'm going to be speaking on tonight touches on aspects of my book, Justice, Unity, and the Hidden Christ, which was launched just prior to this lecture. So those that have attended the lecture will recognize a few, um, a few reference points, which I will now elaborate on this evening. The book asks the question of whether Christians of differing confessions can commonly declare Christ to the world through acts of social justice. This was a prospect that was articulated in paragraph 12 of Vatican II's Declaration on Ecumenism, Unitatis Redinza Gratio. The paragraph begins with, this word, with these words. Before the whole world, let all Christians confess their faith in the triune God, one and three in the incarnate Son of God, our Redeemer and Lord. United in their efforts and with mutual respect, let them bear witness to our common hope, which does not play us false. In these days, when cooperation in social matters is so widespread, all men without exception are called to work together, with much greater reason all those who believe in God, but most of all, all Christians that they bear the name of Christ. Cooperation amongst Christians vividly expresses the relationship which in fact already unites them and sets in clearer relief the features of Christ the servant. The paragraph goes on to elaborate a few examples of such social matters, which we can put under the recognizable banner of social justice. Now on its face, it's a very attractive prospect. And indeed, many people have been attracted by that prospect and have plunged into the enterprise since its declaration in 1964. And many continue in their commitment to that promise to this day. Sadly, however, we are nowhere closer to communion than we were 50 years ago via the route of social justice. And such frustration has caused many to abandon social justice as a means of fostering Christian unity if not abandon the prospect of Christian unity altogether. Such a response is an understandable one, because many are asking the question of whether joint Christian social action can really bring about Christian unity. However, it is understandable only because their questioning goes no further than this. And the task of the book was to show other questions that need to be asked. So while the book did start with the question of whether joint social action by Christians can bring about Christian unity, there was a more foundational question which, still, uh, which will be the focus of this lecture. Before one can ask if a Christian action builds Christian unity, one must first ask, what is a Christian action? Or to put it another way, how does one act in such a way that can be recognized as Christian, not only by those within the church, but those outside the church as well? Now, at first glance, this may seem like an incredibly stupid question. Academics tend to do that a lot. Jesus gives us the assurance in the Gospel of John in chapter 13, verse 35, that people will know that we are Christians by the love that we show for one another. So, before we all pack our bags and leave this lecture theatre, let me remind you that the Apostle Paul also has a rebuke in his letter to the Romans, chapter 2, verse 24, which, while on its face, is a reference to Israel, could just as easily apply to those new chosen people within the church. And the rebuke is, the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you. So there is a risk then that our displays of charity, our displays of Christian action, may not be so demonstrably Christian to those observing the action. Indeed, actions that may have come from ostensibly Christian motivations 
might end up being a source of reproach, a source of scandal to those observing the action. And there are many examples of this. But the question arises, if Jesus provides us with this assurance, then why is there such a disjuncture between the action and the reception of the action by the observer? So you know the question, why is there this disjuncture despite the assurance by Jesus? The reason why this is the case is because standing between the seemingly Christian action by the Christian actor and the observer of that action is an act of interpretation. We have sappy self-help books too numerous to count that have attested time and time again that actions are like a love language. And languages require interpretation in order to be understood as it moves from the speaker to the hearer. We are quite comfortable with the idea that words need to be interpreted. And yet, the notion that actions require interpretation is something that may strike many as strange. We think it is strange because we have become conditioned into thinking of actions as just the outworking of our own individual intentions. If what is sought is to be affected, sorry, if what is sought to be affected is a Christian action, so the prevailing wisdom goes, then what should take place is the Christian agent injecting Christian intention to his or her own actions to bring about a Christian effect. Again, we have seen many examples of this line of argument put into action. In contrast to this line of argument, however, the book argues that this conception of Christian action is part of a complex, not of facts, but rather presumptions about how people act and how people think the world is. Moreover, the book argues that such presumptions, many of which are philosophically modern in nature, will have trouble finding currency in our current postmodern age. A few of these presumptions will be laid out this evening. The book will also argue that there are contextual factors at play in deciphering a Christian action than just the, the Christian intentions of a Christian individual. And those contextual elements will also be laid out and explained this evening. Part of the reason why we often look to intentions of the actor is that whether we are conscious of it or not, we often assume that the shape of an action itself is neutral in terms of its ideational content. We think that the actor, the person doing the action, can just undertake a particular form of the action, and it is the actor's intentions that are key in shaping the purpose, the logic, and end result of the action. The primacy given to intention in shaping neutral actions in the 20th century is explored in much greater detail in the first chapter of the book. Suffice to say that it was the first developed fully, though not with the same language of intention, by the great 20th century Thomas philosopher. Uh, <laughs> great 20th century Thomas philosopher Jacques Maritain. Maritain's innovations in philosophy, insofar as they related to intentions, really come to the fore, however, when they are taken up by the popes after the Second World War. Blessed John XXIII, for instance, explicitly laid this out as the foundation of a program for Catholics to be agents of peace in his famous encyclical Pacem in Terris, or Peace on Earth. In that encyclical, John XXIII spoke of how Catholics should integrate faith and reason, but to do so, quote, in accordance with the laws which govern each and every such activity. In other words, the laws of the secular sphere, observing the principles which correspond to their respective natures. This is all laid out in paragraph 150 of Pacem in Terris. So what becomes key then in transforming the action is transforming what he calls the motivating force of the actions, the term that is used in paragraph 152, such that the action itself 
in spite of retaining the institutional shape set by the secular sphere, could nonetheless be animated by what John XXIII calls a Christian spirit. In a similar fashion, Paul VI, in his encyclical on the church, Ecclesiam Suam, spoke of the transformation of the temporal world by the church, which consisted of, quote, proclaiming principles which represent the highest achievement of human thought. The thought behind temporal action was where the church played its most important role, while the shape of the temporal action itself was something that the church had to adapt to. You can find the full text of this in paragraph 16 and paragraph 42 of Ecclesiam Suam. And it does not matter the form that the action must adapt to, so long as the result produced is in conformity with the intention. In other words, the thinking behind Christian action as dependent on intention and outcome is kind of like the saying about making burgers and sausages. If you really like them both, don't think too hard about how they are made. <laughs> the question that we need to ask ourselves, which by sheer coincidence, and only by sheer coincidence, is the question that the book also asks, is whether you can make such a neat distinction between intention behind the action on the one hand and the institutional shape of the action by an, on the other, and giving a philosophical version of it is the thought that counts. Moreover, can this distinction hold up in postmodernity? A response can be found in the works of two late 20th century Thomas philosophers, namely Alistair MacIntyre, Professor Emeritus of the University of Notre Dame in South Bend, Indiana, and Tracy Rowland, in the John Paul II Institute of Marriage and Family in Melbourne. The thinking of both McIntyre and Rowland can be summed up as a critical engagement with the idea of don't worry about the pedigree, just look at the results. It's a phrase that is found in Rowland's book, Culture and the Thomist Tradition. For both of these thinkers, pedigree does matter. It does matter how sausages are made. And the foodies in this audience will know this. <laughs> this is because pedigree, the process, the institutional shape of the action is not a neutral category. And it is so for several reasons. The first thing that we need to do is to understand how actions work. Actions do not take place in isolation. Rather, actions are always undertaken in relation to a whole host of other actions. An easy way to think about this relational conception of action is to think about your intention to drive. One's intention to drive, to drive from point A to point B, is never straightforward. And in Sydney, where I live, it is really never straightforward. The action will get caught up in a whole series of other intentions and actions from other drivers on the road, obstacles, buildings, pedestrians, and dare I say it, cyclists. <laughs> these others, these other, um, uh, other players on the road impact upon your intention and the institutional shape of your driving. In other words, your driving will be filtered by the behavior of those driving around you. To put this more abstractly, the moment any action takes on a particular institutional shape, the action will already come filtered through a series of other actions, which collectively Alistair MacIntyre calls a tradition or what the French postmodern philosopher Michel Foucault calls a discourse. I see some of my old philo um, political philosophy students are here. You know what Michel Foucault um, would have said about discourse. In other words, with every intention to act, there's a pedigree, there's a tradition, there's a discourse that is shaping that act. Every action that works out my intentions 
are always going to be filtered through these traditions or discourses. And when you do that, you are doing something more than working out your own intentions. What you are doing is allowing the meaning of your action to be set and determined, to be shaped by the tradition or by the discourse. Because for McIntyre and for Michel Foucault, the institutional shape of an action always comes preloaded with a set of other intentions and theories set by others. Furthermore, presum these presumptions are not just things pertaining to turning left or right or whether you put garlic or rosemary in your sausage. The French sociologist Pierre Bourdieu argued in his book entitled An Outline of a Theory of Practice, he argued in his book that the shape of every move that a person makes, however minute, is, quote, capable of instilling a cosmology, an ethic, a metaphysic, a political philosophy, through injunctions as insignificant, these are still Pierre Bourdieu's words, through injunctions as insignificant as stand up straight or don't hold your knife in your left hand. All of these instill a cosmology, an ethic, and a metaphysic. Similarly, the Austrian-American sociologists Peter Berger and Thomas Luckmann, and here I see my students cringe again um, because I have exposed them to the, um, uh, to the rigors of, of Berger and Luckmann, they have, as they have argued in their famous book, The Social Construction of Reality, the shape of an action already carries with it important ideas that go to the very foundations of human identity, go to the foundations of their place in the world, and even conceptions of God. For McIntyre and for Roland, institutions that shape an action already come preloaded with questions of God's existence, if God does exist, God's love, if God really is love, and God's relation with humankind, if God even cares. Thus, for McIntyre, Roland, and Foucault, any person, including any Christian, in adapting his or her actions to suit the institutional shape of his or her surroundings, will accept the presumed meanings that are set by those surrounding institutions, even the foundational ones about God. To put this into more concrete terms, one question they may ask is whether a person who believes in the love of God would adapt his actions to suit an institution whose life suggests that God had long since abandoned the earth. Would a priest, for example, bless the weapons of war? Is it enough for me to say, I did say a prayer for the guy before I blew his brains off? But more subtly, can a Christian say that he is acting in a Christian manner whilst adapting his actions to the institutions of the current culture, such as the modern state as mediated by the party or the market as mediated by the mall? These are not just spiritual questions to ask yourself after the real business of taking action. Those presumptions, having woven into the action that you have intended, will then have an impact in shaping your actions and thereby the outcomes. But wait, one might protest, would not my intentions provide the sufficient steering power for my actions? I may not get from point A to point B in a straight line, but I would still get from point A to point B. To this, McIntyre will respond by asking a series of other questions such as, did you crash along the way? Was your point B the original point B? The reason why he might ask these questions and the claim of my book is that as the shape of the actions work forward to shape outcomes, those institutional, the institutional shape of the actions can also work backward to shape my intentions. I will say that again, as the shape of the actions work forward to shape outcomes, they also work backward to shape my intentions. Now to understand this, we need to explore what it means to intend something as a Christian. 
Here, the thought of the Anglican theologian Graham Ward is very useful. In a chapter of his book entitled The Politics of Discipleship, Ward spoke about the common presumption that anyone undertaking an action knows exactly what he wants before undertaking the action to get what he wants. Now, in contradistinction to this, Ward follows a line from St. Augustine's Confessions. And in, and in contradistinction to the famous 1990s anthem from Culture Beat that says, I know what I want and I want it now, really bad music video, Augustine's implicit refrain when you read his confessions, the refrain that weaves through each of these confessions is, I am a mystery to myself. For Augustine, a person always acts from a stance of incomplete knowledge of all things, including himself. And to claim otherwise would be an act of self-deception. To bring this into the context of this lecture, this means that intentions are never firmly formed before an action is taken. In addition to this uncertainty of intention, there is an added complication in that we don't just intend or that or we don't just know with our minds. The philosopher Blaise Pascal once famously said, quote, that the heart has reasons which reason itself cannot know. In a similar vein, Pierre Bourdieu and Berger and Lokman express less explicitly, all of them say that our bodies have reasons which reason itself cannot know. Pierre Bourdieu particularly calls the body a store of memory, a durable manner of standing and speaking. These are Pierre Bourdieu's words. The body is a durable manner of standing and speaking and thereby of feeling and thinking. In other words, we think with our bodies. In a way, the body can bypass the intentions of one's mind. They can bypass the intentions of one's mind to enact intentions other than one's own. Now, this is easy to do since, as we have seen with Augustine, intentions are never fully certain to begin with. We can then get some insight into Paul's line in his letter to the Romans, chapter 7, verse 15, when he says, I do not understand what I do. For what I want to do, I do not do, and what I hate, I do. This is in chapter 7, verse 15 of Paul's letter to the Romans. To borrow from the language to, uh, of Michel Foucault, Intentions and identity are always subject to being processed and altered by discourses built into the institutional shape of actions. So as the action is taken, the shape of the action will end up shaping the intentions of the actor. Now recall that the shape of the action and its resultant grammar is formed in relation to the grammar of the tradition and the institutions that surround the action. It may be understandable to presume that we can find the Christian logic of a single action, because on an everyday level, we often judge character on the basis of single actions. That was a brave thing you did, one might say. What you did was dishonest, other might say. You gave me flowers, how thoughtful. But wait, no chocolate, you fiend. Right? The varieties are endless. But as tonight's coverage of McIntyre, Roland, Foucault and the like have obviously, uh, hopefully shown, understanding what a Christian action is involves understanding how we act more generally. Understanding our actions in relation to other actions and how our intentions are formed and more importantly, who our intentions are formed by. If there is anything to take up tonight, it is that Christian action is formed by its context. We now need to ask ourselves, what is the context that we have here? What is the context that we live in here and now? And do we, as Christians, have a context of our own? Answering these questions will form the remainder of this paper tonight. Now first, to the relationship between the individual actor 
and the institutions that form the context. It should become clear or as, that when one is undertaking an action, one is not simply undertaking an action. Because if the grammar of the action is formed by the institutions that form the context, and if those institutions can shape an action and also the actor, this could mean that any action is also a bridge between the person doing the act and the institutions that form the culture around the actor. To this, I'm going to throw yet another French name, which is the 20th century French Jesuit and social theorist, Michel de Certeau. In a book entitled The Practice of Everyday Life, a really wonderful little piece of social theory, de Certeau spoke about how every action that we take as individuals implicate more than just a person doing the action. For Certeau, every action is always going to be a movement by one towards another. Now this movement is not, it's more than simply moving. It's not just moving, it's more, it's more than even moving towards another individual. Every movement that we make as individuals is also going to be a commitment of myself to another. Every act is also going to be a commitment of myself to another, a belonging to that other. The 20th century phenomenologist Maurice Merleau-Ponty, I'm so sorry I'm just throwing French and German names um, left, right and centre, but the French phenomenologist, another guy by the name of Maurice Merleau-Ponty, argues that when we act, our bodies are so deeply integrated into its surroundings such that every action that we make becomes a commitment to that environment even if that commitment is unarticulated or even unintended. And this means an unspoken commitment to the institutions that form the shape of the action. In other words, every action that I do is not just a declaration of what I intend to do. I am also making a statement with my actions about the communities that I belong to and the communities I am making a commitment to sustain. To put this in more concrete terms, it means that every action I make as an individual, such as driving, involves making a commitment to a public body and the institutions that make driving possible, such as the traffic system with all its signs, lights and lines in Sydney, the road raging bogans are also thrown in as a bonus. And even more subtly, it is a commitment to the institutions of the state, such as the police force, when things go wrong, the government department in charge of roads to maintain them, the manufacturing sector that makes the cars, and so on. What this means is that as I adapt the action to suit its institutional surroundings, I am committing myself with my actions to a series of public bodies whose existence I may not even be conscious of. These bodies, these institutions, these signs and patterns of action, they come together to form what Charles Taylor calls a social imaginary. Imaginary, not in the sense that it's made up in our minds, but in the sense that they can capture and command our individual and collective imaginations. Actor, I might come up with Christian intentions and values, maybe to change secular culture, for instance. However, the fact that such an intention has to adapt to its institutional surroundings might mean that with every move I make, I am unconsciously making a commitment to the institutions within secular culture. And in the book, I look at three of the most dominant institutions, namely the state, civil society, and the market. Because these institutions come with their own traditions and thus their own value set, they can in turn shape my Christian actions and thus the intended Christian outcome. Indeed, in light of the Augustinian point that we never really know anything in full, these unconscious commitments go as far as to reshape my intentions and values without being conscious of it. So, in a strange turning of tables, it can be possible that secular public bodies 
can determine for the Christian actor what is or is not a Christian value or a Christian action. I'll repeat that. In a strange turning of tables, it can be possible that secular bodies can determine for the Christian actor what is or is not a Christian value or a Christian action. In the process, we can come with the best intentions to act upon the Christian faith, but end up propagating parodies of that faith. And the parodies are manifold. Secular institutions such as the state and the market have so dominated the social landscape and in so dominating the social landscape have reshaped faith in its image. We now have a situation where faith equals personally held ideas or a form of individual therapy rather than a participation in the life of a communion. We now have a situation where the culture of life is confined to a subset of issues determined by one side of politics or another. We now have a situation where the love of Christ can become confused or even subordinated to the love of country. We now have a situation where Jesus can become the heavenly boyfriend of megachurch hymnodies everywhere. We now have a situation where unlimited individual choice and liberty become substitutes for the cross of Christ and the spirit becomes a rubber stamp to be or to do whatever I want. And the propagation of crass materialism is now seen as an unfolding of the kingdom of God, where policy think tanks and civil leaders deign to tell Christians what should or should not be the teachings of the church. The list goes on. And with every example in that list, bring, it brings to life that rebuke of St. Paul, the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you. Now, if, as McIntyre, Roland, Foucault, Deserteau, Merleau-Ponty, and, and others have suggested, if these are right, that the institutional context of the action is such a powerful force in defining the contours of a Christian action and even Christian intentions, if this is true, then it should become apparent that what is needed in safeguarding the integrity of the Christian action is ensuring that there is a Christian institutional context to the action. Now this requires not Christian nations, not Christian prime ministers or Christian malls or Christian theme parks, true story, or stronger intentions or values for in, from individual Christians. Rather, what it requires is a more robust conception of the church than merely a collection of individual Christians. Now, I say this with a great degree of caution, particularly in light of the current situation that the church faces. But this caution does not negate the assertion that the church remains the proper context for embedding and protecting a Christian action. If Christian action is shaped by its commitment to public bodies, then Christian action is safeguarded when the actor's commitment to the, sorry, then Christian action is safeguarded by the actor's commitment to the church as a public body. A proper Christian action, in other words, is properly an ecclesial action. But what differentiates this public body called the church from secular public bodies is that the primary institutions of this public body are not the state, civil society, or the market. The primary institutions of the church and the proper context for Christian action were identified by Pope Emeritus Benedict XVI in paragraph 25 of his first encyclical, Deus Caritas Est. In that paragraph, Benedict spoke of the church not as an institution, it's important to know this. He doesn't speak of the church as an institution. Rather, he said that, quote, the deepest nature of the church is expressed in her threefold responsibility of proclaiming the word of God, what he calls kerigma martyria, celebrating the sacraments, otherwise known as liturgia, and exercising the ministry of charity, otherwise known as diakonia. Christian action, in other words, is one where acts of diakonia have the church as their institutional context. 
embodied in acts of worship in liturgia and proclamation in kerygma materia. Benedict not only identifies these institutional elements, he goes on in paragraph 25 of Deus Caritas S to say that each of these elements of the church's threefold responsibility presuppose each other and are inseparable. To isolate even one would render all three unrecognizable as Christian in character. We now then need to ask another question. How could these other elements, such as liturgia, provide the institutional safeguard for a Christian action? Chapter 4 of the book outlines the way in which liturgy, liturgia, provides the setting of the church's public action by itself creating the church as a public space. It is no accident that liturgy comes from this Greek word liturgia, which means public work. I focus on worship in the book because, as Rodney Clapp once remarked in his book called A Peculiar People, liturgy, he says, is the public work par excellence of the church, something that, if omitted, the church would no longer be the church. It also delineates the public logic of the church, and by extension, liturgy defines the ecclesial logic for the Christian action. To quote Rodney Clapp again, far from being a retreat from the real world, worship enables Christians to see what the real world is and equips them to live in it. And the reality that the institution of worship and liturgy enables Christians to see is one that will be very different from the reality that is defined by the value set of the state, civil society, and market. Instead of assuming that God has nothing to do with the affairs of this world, the liturgy reminds us that, in the words of the Eucharistic prayer, God is continually sanctifying the things of this world and, more importantly, blessing them and filling them with life. Instead of an economy that looks at the things of this world, human, animal, and vegetable, as mere instruments to exploit for our desires, the liturgy reminds us in the offertory of another economy where the things of this world, human, animal, and vegetable, are not things to exploit, but gifts to us that we are given to us by God and that we offer back to God. In the words of Robert Tilley at the Catholic Institute of Sydney, the Eucharist is an economic act. The Eucharist declares another economics, saying to all in the words of Isaiah chapter 55, come you who are without money. Instead of declaring to you that you are fundamentally alone, which in turn makes an economics of self-interest a virtue, the liturgy from its very beginning draws your attention to a God that is both one and communal, because God is a triune God. And because God is a triune God, the worship of God will also thrust your attention to the communion of saints. It will thrust your attention to your brothers and sisters in the church, the heavenly hosts, the saints and angels, all of whom participate in the same Eucharistic bread and wine. Moreover, the liturgical action does more than have you celebrate the communion of saints. The liturgical action commits you to the communion of saints. The Eucharist, and indeed all prayer, in the words of the founder of communion and liberation, Luigi Giussani, generates what he calls unavoidable solicitations from the saints, to which the person who is at prayer is called to say a forceful yes with all of the resources of his heart and mind. And instead of presuming that the present is all we have, and that and only those that occupy the present have the last say, instead of the most powerful presently having the last say, the liturgy draws our attention to the day of salvation and the appointed time at the end of history when earth is restored back to God by Jesus Christ and when the last shall become first. Moreover, the liturgy reminds us that 
in the words of Paul's second letter to the Corinthians, now is the day of salvation, now is the appointed time, now the last shall become first. And because now is the appointed time, the institutions of this world, the powers and principalities of this world do not have the last say on what the world is like, nor does it have the last say on how Christians should act or think in this world. Nor does it have the last say when Christians are told that they can only do Christian acts in this world by conforming to the pattern of this world. To use Paul's letter to the Romans, chapter 12, verse 2. The church in its worship, the church in its proclamation, can and should lay down the foundations for Christian action by bringing to this world the albeit faint glimmer of another world. In this other world, and sorry, and this other world is in turn brought to life in this world through the church's diaconia, through a pattern of ecclesial actions, which the church has traditionally called the works of mercy. You have the corporal works of mercy, such as to feed the hungry, to give drink to the thirsty, to clothe the naked, to harbour the harbourless, to visit the sick, to ransom the captive, to bury the dead. You also have the spiritual works of mercy, to instruct the ignorant, to counsel the doubtful, to admonish the sinner, to bear wrong, to forgive, to comfort, and to pray for the dead. No one set of the works of mercy can be stricken from another in the name of political expediency. Nor, if we are to take Benedict XVI seriously, can the works of mercy be recognizable as such without embedding them in the proper ecclesial setting of proclamation and worship. To conclude, a way to think about Christian action is to think about the section in the parable of the sower when the seed fell among thorns, a parallel that is drawn in the final chapter of my book. In the Gospels, the seed of the word is found to compete with all of the alternative word of the thorns. The Gospel of Matthew describes this alternative word as the worries of this world. While there is no doubt about the intention to manifest the word in the seed, it's having to work through the setting defined by the worries of this world and the physical manifestations thereof meant that the word, the seed, eventually becomes hidden. It becomes obscured. In the same way, a Christian action that is filtered through the institutions that manifest the worries of this world runs the risk of being rendered unrecognizable as Christian or, at, or worse, distorted to become another extension of this world. The Gospel of Luke's coverage of the parable of the sower in chapter 8 of the Gospel has a subtle but very interesting suggestion. In talking about the good soil, Jesus said that the good soil are those who hear the word of God and then hold it fast in an honest and good heart and bring forth fruit with patience. This is in chapter 8 of the Gospel of Luke. As I have hopefully suggested in this presentation, the honest and good heart is never assured solely by individual intentions because, as Augustine reminds us, we are often mysteries to ourselves and thus we can never be fully aware of ourselves or sure of ourselves. This honesty and good heart and the fruit of that honest and good heart must be cultivated not from the soil of thorns, not from the institutions that represent the powers and principalities of this world. Christian action is born from the good soil of a proper ecclesial context, an ecclesial tradition, McIntyre might say. The good soil is maintained not by conceiving of ourselves first as citizens of this world who happen to be Catholic, but as citizens of a heavenly city that must pass through this world first. The horizon of heaven cannot be kept in view in institutions that say that heaven or hell are not relevant in the, in the market, in the state, and the bureaucracies, parties, and practices that they serve. 
the horizon of heaven that nourishes Christian action is kept primarily in the institutions of the body of Christ, in the communion of saints, whose existence and whose citizenship we proclaim to share in the church every time we worship. To repeat, Christian action is first and foremost an extension of that body of Christ, an extension of that public body called the church, using not party and platform, but worship, proclamation, and the works of mercy. Christian action requires more than mere doctrinal allegiance. It requires a scrutiny of the powers and principalities in whose territory the church must travel as it moves towards the final things. It requires more discernment as to whether in its public practices, the church is really being itself or subordinating itself to become some secular, political or cultural operative. Christian action involves not only a yes to Christ. To borrow from the philosopher of the Frankfurt School, Herbert Marcuse, it also involves a great refusal a great protest against what he calls the mode in which man and things are made to appear to sing and sound and speak. And Christian action can only be made to speak to this world in its fullness as a Christian action when action is coupled with the singing of a new song to our God in the body of Christ in a stark protest against the argument that this world is all we have. A Christian action within the body of Christ takes up and acts out the, the words of Paul's second letter to the Corinthians. And I'll just end it here. If anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old has passed away and behold, all things are made new. I thank you for your attention. Thank you, Matthew. That was wonderful. I'll, I'll um, talk further on that. But we do have um, a bit of time for some Q and A. If people are, have any questions they would like to, to pose to Matthew, maybe um, like what Putin was doing in the slideshow was yeah. an interesting one to answer. <laughs> <laughs> but please. Um, Feel free if you have some questions for Matthew. Thank you once again, Dr. Tan. Fascinating as always. Um, I'm not sure if this is a question that's going to be dismissed very quickly, but one question I did have was that Paul, I know she kept bringing up of our intentions perhaps not being what we intended been shaped by other factors. How does that dialogue with the concept of like our free will in making an intention? Mm -hmm. That's a good question. The, um, to say that we are not fully aware does not mean that we are not aware at all. That's the, that's the simple answer. There is free will because there is still some, there's still some volition, but that will is still not fully formed. And we, um, you know, and August, you know, using people like Augustine would then say that even though the will is formed, right? Uh, sorry, even though we use our, even though there is free will, we cannot kid ourselves into thinking that the will is so formed that we then are so sure of what we want, right? I mean, Paul says this: I, I'm, I, I'm a mystery to myself. I do not understand what I do. Does that mean that he has no free will? No, right? Rather, what it means is that there is something that is working on his will, something that is impairing the will, right? Thereby steering the will towards things other than what we intend, right? Thereby, you know, his line, whatever I hate, I do, right? Does that answer your question? So it's not to say that because the, um, Augustine says, um, you know, that we are a mystery of ourselves means that we know nothing at all. We do know something, but it's always going to be incomplete, right? Paul says in the, in the first letter of the Corinthians, you know that, you know that I, I always use this, uh, use this passage a lot, it's one of my favorite passages, you know that, that whole love is patient, love is kind that has been used ad nauseum at weddings everywhere, right? Have you noticed that the passage, love never fails, you know that, that line, love never fails, 
Have you noticed that it does not end with a full stop? It ends with a semicolon, which means that you know, um, there is something coming after it. But the weddings always never get to that. And what the, what the, wedding, uh, sorry, what the non-wedding version, i.e. the biblical version, gets to is that love never fails because, I mean, I'm, I'm paraphrasing here, right? Love never fails because prophecy will fail and knowledge will be destroyed. Because we know in part and we prophesy in part. This is in Paul's first letter to the Corinthians chapter 13. Have a look at that. I, I, I highly recommend it. Right? So does that, does that answer your question? Yes, absolutely. Cool. Any others? Otto? Yes. Um, Dr. Tan, uh, forgive me if I'm wrong. Um, you Adolf are wrong. Hitler. Sorry. <laughs> no, sorry, keep going. Sorry, keep going. Um, sorry, keep going. Adolf Hitler, you control the youth, you control the future. Mm -hmm. um, and in regards to this uh, counter uh, societal push, to uh, that uh, Archbishop Coleridge mentioned in his uh, speech about your book in, about bringing Christ back into the world. Um, I went to a school that, uh, whilst identified as Catholic, um, was lacking in faith, but did uh, do uh, good works in regards to the uh, social justice uh, era. Um, how are we uh, hoping to create this counter societal push when the youth of today, who will become the adults of tomorrow, aren't experiencing Christ in their formational years and only in the um, societal justice arena? Now that's a good question. Do you know what G.K. Chesterton said the biggest problem in the church was? I am. That was his response, right? And so what the, um, you know, and so what the, um, you know, this may sound like a, you know, sound like a dodging of your, of your question, but what it actually says is that what does it take to actually, um, you know, to actually counter this, you know, counter this, 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 this trend, right? Whereby one is not able to encounter Christ, be that an encounter with Christ. Right? The Luigi Giussani, whom I mentioned before, um, in um, the founder of Communion and Liberation, one of the, the lay movements um, in the church, he said that part of the problem that we have is not that we, have, that we don't have enough Catholic institutions. Part of the problem is that, we, that these institutions are not facilitating the encounter with Christ. And the encounter with Christ is not made in institutions. It is made within within persons. This idea of the interpersonal encounter with Christ, right, is the um, is the key. He says, right, to 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 changing the to changing every institution, right. And so what we what we need is, is the formation of persons such that the person, when he leaves the um, you know the worship context, can become that opportunity for that encounter with Christ. Now, part of the reason why many may not experience that encounter with Christ is because we have become too used to disengaging certain things from everything else, right? And in so, and, and in so doing, we have sort of been unable to see how the thing that we do in the chapel or in the church, right, comes to translate itself into the, uh, into the world around and outside the church such that what you encounter or, rather, or more specifically who you encounter in the four walls of the church, in the Eucharist, in the body of Christ can then be facilitated and translated into and handed over into the, uh, in, into the world around us. That is not going to take place in institutions, that is going to take place in persons, right? But what this means is that there's need, there needs to be this whole economy, this whole um, uh, environment within which persons are formed. Okay? There is no easy way to answer that question, but the key to that is that, you need to, uh, is that one needs to recognize that the encounter with Christ does not take, 